Aloha, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Coleman, and I'm here as your co-host of this latest episode of Talking Tax with uh, my colleague and the main man really here, Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. I'm uh, with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and we're going to have a good time today actually talking about um, a column that Tom wrote, uh, published on the Tax Foundation website and also in newspapers throughout the state. He has a weekly column, and and this week he wrote about uh, the the headline was "Keep Tourists Out," and it was about the uh, gradual reopening of tourism on in the Lahaina area, the West Maui area, um, the protests against tourism reopening in that area, and um, some of the implications of what that all means. You know, is it a good idea? Uh, does the government really have a right to keep people out in the first place? And uh, similar similar situation problems like that. So um, I, I thought it was a really great article. Uh, uh, prompted a lot of thought about the issues involved. Uh, it didn't go real. It wasn't a super deep dive, but it touched a lot of bases. Uh, the, the 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 basis for the article was, uh, or the jumping off point to talk about it was the fact that. A little town in Vermont recently did a similar thing uh, in blocking tourists from coming through their town during those during the fall period. Uh, it was in early October, late September, early October. Uh, apparently, a lot of people were tracing through the through the little town to take pictures of the of the leaves turning to their beautiful colors during the fall, and they weren't being very respectful of the neighborhood. Uh, violating property rights, trespassing, polluting, etc. So that was a, kind of an interesting thing. I, I think it's. I think they lifted that ban. I don't think anybody challenged it constitutionally, but they did get away with it for a little while. And uh, we'd like to see how they how they managed to be able to what what the thinking is behind those who think we can ban tourism in Hawaii, whether temporarily and for whatever good reason it might be. Tom, I think the the phrase. Phrases in your article that I really liked were that um, there's only one thing we need to realize is, is that there's only so much our government is allowed to do. And uh, this relates to the constitutional right to travel. If, 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 if people on Maui are allowed to go to West Oahu or West Maui, excuse me, then tourists... Well, well well, let's yeah, let's 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 kind of um, uh, open up you know what the, what the context is, and uh, uh, I'm I'm sure you've heard of Sleepy Hollow uh, from is that the Headless Edward Horseman? Trent. Headless Horseman and Sleepy Hollow, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, we, we we were talking about the town of Pomfret in Vermont, which has. Uh, one of the most picturesque areas of the country for fall fully is called Sleepy Hollow Farm. And that's the town that decided to close two of its main roads to tourists for the seasons because some of the tourists who did show up, damaged roads, had accidents, required towing out of ditches, trampled gardens, defecated on private property. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty tough. Uh, parked in fields and driveways and uh, we're not nice to res residents. They actually put uh, no trespassing signs on private property, and uh, uh, tourists basically didn't respect those. They went into the property anyway, mm. as the videos uh, showed. This was on NBC News. Um, a lot of wide coverage. That whole idea was picked up by BBC and travel and leisure and all kinds of places. Right. Um, Obviously, this uh, this wasn't true of all tourists. Some of the, some of the tourists, of course, were you know good and respectful people, but there were a lot that weren't, and uh, there were enough of the uh, there were enough of the latter to make the, the you know the town uh, close the, uh, the the roads to tourists and see if they could get away with it. Yeah, I kept looking. I kept looking for follow-up articles uh, to see if anyone had challenged the constitutionality of that ban, but um, I, I guess they lifted it relatively soon before anybody could. You know, it wasn't a permanent thing. 
I guess all the leaves fell off the trees or already or something. I don't know why. But, yeah, uh, that, yeah, the uh, fall foliage time is, is, is not permanent. It only happens a little, you know, for a few, uh, I guess a few weeks. Uh, but, but, but the reason it, it seemed relevant to me was because um, the West Maui residents had given our governor uh, a, a petition with 14,000 signatures saying, hey, um, we're not ready to reopen this area to tourists. Keep, keep the tourists out. And, and I was thinking, well, why is that? Um, and then the people who were pushing the petition had, had kind of the same complaints. Uh, people who worked in the visitor service industries were, you know, were bothered by tourists asking them about whether they were displaced and, you know, making them uh, li relive the horrific day. Uh, I mean, it's sure, I'm sure it makes good stories, but uh, I mean, if, if people wanted their privacy, couldn't they, couldn't they just say, you know, I don't want to talk about it? You know, e even if they're like bartenders or you know, stuff like that. Um, they saw uh, some tourists doing, you know, dumb or disrespectful things like like, you know, taking selfies with the, you know, burned out shells of, you know, some of the cars or, or what used to be cars uh, are on Front Street in Lahaina. Yeah, so, I can imagine it's pretty offensive in, in a sense and, and, and uh, real sensitive if you're, if you're there. Yeah, I mean, with, with uh, I, I don't know if, if you... Uh, have have been to Lahaina recently? I think you know certainly people in your your shop have been. I mean, wh what's it like? I mean, what what's the why? What's animating the sentiment uh, to uh, you know sign such a petition? Well, I have not been there myself. Joe's been there. Joe Kent, our executive director, he actually used to live there. As you know, we had him on the show here um, a couple of shows ago to talk about what was going on there. But so without any real personal insight, just gleaning from media reports, I, I think it might be just tied in with this general anti-tourism sentiment that we ha that we see for the entire state in recent years, <clears throat> which is understandable, you know, considering how many tourists there are and the uh, burden they place on our infrastructure and our environment and whatever. Yeah, I mean, one one thing that we have in, in our state uh, is a love hate relationship with tourism. Yes, uh, we need it. Uh, it's basically our whole economy, but not everybody likes it. Yeah, uh, not every, not everybody likes lots of tourism, where they might be able to stand a little bit of it. Uh, when it gets more and more, it gets you know more offensive, I guess, because you have more folks coming and, and, and doing dumb things like, um, you know, not respecting private property and, uh, you know, po pooping on sidewalks or whatever you have you, you know. Well, we, well, the other point you made in your article was that, well, first of all, you said, as I pointed out, that there's only so much our government is allowed to do. Now, that made me wonder, well, by what authority were they blocking Basically, to 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 go back a little bit, the the petition by those fourteen thousand people to to postpone reopening West Maui to tourism that implied that there was already a ban on people going there. So I I tried to figure out well where did that ban come from, um, and it turns out that the governor's executive order on that issue never really did ban travel to that area. He only uh, said that he wanted to discourage travel to West Maui. And um, well, so but there was there was an actual ban that was placed on the area because of yeah, uh, it was Mayor the, Bisson who did it. And, yeah, and the, the toxic substances in the soil. And well, the there ash. was the wildfire disaster area. And not only did he impose um, a ban on on visitors going into that area, unauthorized visitors, you know, to, to go in there, you had to show proof of residency, your, your, your driver's license or your, an electrical utility bill or something that showed that you actually used to live there if you don't still. Um, but tourists 
the only exception for them was if you already had uh, reservations at one of those hotels in the area. And so there were some exceptions, but, um, and he even imposed a curfew for people who were in the, in the wildlife, in the, in the Lahaina wildfires disaster area, which is, you know, stretches from here to there somewhere in, in West Maui. It's, it's basically West Maui. So I wondered when they, when the governor said he was going to reopen it on August, on October 8th, I thought, oh, well, he never really closed it. But then Mayor Bisson had an emergency order that did technically close it uh, uh, to unauthorized people. And so he came and said, I want a phased reopening. And that's what the, the, the big tourist um, petition, the anti-tourist petition was all about. And, and maybe it's not fair to call it anti-tourism petition. Maybe it's better to just say they wanted more time to not have tourists around. Um, and, and that's where we got into the idea of, well, is the government even allowed to do that? But I guess they can because it was under an emergency order. And as we know, as we've discussed, government can pretty around here can pretty much do whatever they want if they call it an emergency. So that's- Well, I mean, at, at, the, at the time, um... You know, th th there were a couple of things going for it, and, and, and that is, you know, the order didn't apply just to tourists. It, it applied to everybody. Right. Uh, and there, there were concerns about health and safety. Mm -hmm. uh, like the, uh, you know, toxic substances and the ash, uh, which, you know, were, were kind of dealt with by EPA. I think they're still doing it right now. Yeah. Uh, applying this, uh, you know, the chemical to, to, to seal off, um, you know, the ash from the rest of the, the rest of the world. And that would be the uh, primary justification to promote public safety, health and safety, right? So you could do it on that basis as long as it's not discriminatory. Yeah, but uh, when you when you're talking about just saying you know tourists go home. Then, then you've got, I think, a, a, a two more things to think about. One is uh, whether government can do it, and two is whether the government should do it. Well, whether whether government can do it, uh, then you you kind of have to worry about uh, things like the U.S. Constitution, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, uh, which basically which basically gives us uh, the right to travel. Uh, you know, we as citizens of the U.S. Uh, have the right to go anywhere in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's okay if a, a state says, well, you know, nobody's allowed to go here uh, because of danger or, 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 or you know, whatever reason. Uh, if, they keep, if they keep everybody away from a certain area, that's fine. Uh, but if they only keep tourists away, that's not fine. And, and, and they can't uh, you know, tax uh, tourists for being in a certain place uh, because of that constitutional right to travel. We, we like saw that issue fee? come up. <laughs> like the green fee, the green fee tax? Yeah, as it was originally proposed. No, tourist tax. Um, yeah, you know, you're, 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 you bring a lot of uh, background to bear on this particular topic in your, back, in, in your work at, with the Tax Foundation and, and tracking bills in the legislature. Hawaii really has this penchant, uh, tourism aside, for trying to um, prevent interstate commerce, in a sense. That's what we're talking about, right? The interstate commerce clause uh, uh, or the right to travel. I mean, are they the same thing or what's the overlap there? Well, I mean, with, uh, uh, with the right to travel, uh, it's, you know, rights held by individuals in the U.S., whether or not they're doing commerce. Uh -huh. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so, and, and, and commerce is more economic. Right. Okay, so people are allowed to travel. Do you think that an emerge? I know that during the COVID era, um, the, the, the emergency powers of the state were presumably limited by, did, did it violate an, a, a constitutional right, uh, like a like freedom of assembly or freedom of speech or um and and that was supposedly a guideline so i'm wondering if if someone could challenge an emergency order travel ban that extended beyond matters of public health and safety like for example if the mayor and the governor had agreed to that petition 
which is I think now moot because I did go ahead and reopen, starting to reopen it. Um, would that have been considered if they hadn't done that and they'd left the ban in place? Would that would that be challengeable? Do you think in court? Oh yeah, I think so. Um, there's only so much the government can do. Re restricting travel is uh, something that you know the you know our our U.S. Supreme Court has already said you know violates constitutional rights of people. So you know the government can't do it. Number one, and, and number two, you know re there really is uh, a um, a moral debate on whether government should be, you know, blocking off uh, people from such an area, even, even when you have the 14,000 signatures. Yes. Uh, like in, like in my view, um, there's a lot of personal choices that happen when you, when you go through a disaster, it's like a wildfire. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're living in, uh, in, in Lahaina, uh, you have a choice to either, um, you know, stay home and heal or, or, you know, you have a choice to you know, open up your own business, uh, if you, especially if you had it going before, uh, to see if you can feed your family. And, uh, and to me, it's, it, it raises some questions if, if you're using government to Tell tell these people, look, you know, you, you can't do that. You you can't conduct business because you know the rest of us haven't healed yet. So so we're so we're going to kind of like lock you up until the rest of us are ready. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know the 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 state is kind of in a bind as far as tourism goes. Uh, it, uh, it's it's kind of in the state It's in the Hawaii Revised Statutes. You know the State Planning Act that they're supposed to support tourism and support and assist in the promotion of Hawaii's visitor attractions and facilities. So, you know, that's been sort of shifting the whole conversation recently. I wonder if that's something that that would be something that all those 14,000 people and other people that are concerned about uh, inappropriate activities by the government, if that would be, if that would make sense to argue for a change in this, in the Hawaii revised statute that the, that the government shouldn't necessarily but on the one hand, they shouldn't bar tourists from going to West Maui, but they also shouldn't be promoting tourists coming to Hawaii in the first place. Well, I mean, you got uh, people on, on 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 two sides of that. Uh, I mean, we have something called the Hawaii Tourism Authority, which is there to do just that. It's right. to promote, uh, and and it's and it's funded by public money. Right. You know, certainly, you know, it's a legitimate choice uh, and, and that's kind of made in the legislature every year uh, to keep on funding that agency or making making it change direction I, I mean that's that's a matter of le legitimate legislative choice whether we want to promote tourism or not um, well the other thing you bring up in your article is that you know it's it's the distinction between public and private property which I fully agree with um, on the one hand, if you're a private property owner and you want to let somebody come and visit you, that's good. You know, I mean, that's that should be fine. If you don't want someone to come into your, into your neighborhood, but then it gets to that broader question of like, well, who owns the neighborhood? It's kind of like zoning. Do these fourteen thousand people have a right to control those actual property owners? Because a lot of those fourteen thousand people do not own property. So a lot of them are renters. You know, I'm sure or. Maybe people that don't even live in the area. I don't even. I don't. I don't really know quite who they all are. Um, so private property is really the guiding factor on on these decision making situation. That's what you were saying in your article, which which I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, if you if you've got private property, if you you know have a business, um, isn't it a personal choice as to uh, whether you want to or can continue it or not i mean does this does the government have a right to say you know um you know if there's if there's no overriding health or safety concern for example mm -hmm. do they have the right to say no you can't uh you can't do what you want you can't open a business if you wanted to 
you 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 need to be held back because you know fourteen thousand people want to want want to hold you back. Right, right. Yeah, as a tax attorney, you you see this kind of legislation a lot, don't you? Where you, I, I seem to recall you having flagged a number of tax bills because you felt like they violated um, the federal constitutional, you know, provisions. That like we're part of America, you can't you can't treat people from out of state differently than people who live here. Well, yeah, I mean that 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 is a problem uh, that occurs everywhere. Uh, you know, pe- people in states want to promote their own uh, activities, commerce, industries, whatever, and uh, uh, they would prefer it if if uh, competition from other states uh, wasn't there. Oh yeah. Um, th- there were there were a lot of cases, for example, in the in the 30s and 40s uh, that that dealt with milk. Um, you know, the, the milk producing states didn't want competition from, you know, other states. They wanted to. Like you know, why? You know, <laughs> they, they wanted to have their own milk and uh, they wanted to protect their own, you know, their own cows. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Well, remember uh, in the 70s, I think it was, Ariyoshi, uh when there was all the hubbub about, you know, pop, too many people as, you know, population. There was a lot of concern in the 70s about population bomb and all of that, you know, that we had too many people. And in Hawaii, in fact, the state. Well, that's no longer a concern. I'm yeah. Sure. Well, they were trying to keep cars out. Remember? Uh, don't you remember that? Do you remember that when Ariyoshi was trying to find out if there was a way to, to limit the number of cars that could be imported to Hawaii? I, I tried to look that up. I couldn't find anything, but I have this firm memory of, of – uh, and that got shot down, you know. No, you can't restrict Im- importing cars to Hawaii. Uh, I mean, they're going to do that under the energy mandates. No more gas-powered cars after 2030 or something like that, at least in some states, if not here. Um, but that went down, and, and a lot of the bills that you've opposed went down precisely because of the constitutional provisions for free travel, um, economic commerce should be, you know, no inter- the interstate commerce clause. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the the the, the point is uh, that we're supposed to be one, you know, one big happy country here, and uh, it's you know it's it's um, not good to uh, leave your sister states out of something that you allow your own states uh, people to do uh, in in the in the in the world of commerce. So uh, if uh, if you're going to allow people to sell milk milk in your state, you have to allow uh outsiders to do that too mhm mhm to foster competition not restrict it even right. even though you you know even though you have uh you know dairy cows and you know farmers who want to sell their own milk i'm wondering if um there's a a point to at, at this point um to questioning the ability of the government uh to you know, restrict tourism to Hawaii. I mean, this like this Lahaina situation is this something that is we're not going to have to face this on a broader scale. I don't think ever. That doesn't seem reasonable, right? This is pretty much restricted to this particular situation. Well, so far, but but every so often you see bills in the legislature to you know limit the amount of tourists or. You know, jack up the the TAT, the transient accommodations tax, depending on how many tourists there are. Like if the if it's eight million, jack it up one point. If it's nine million, jack it up two points. If it's ten million, jack it up four points. Uh, until, uh, on, on, I mean, there there have been such proposals. Yes. Uh, hopefully they did. You know, thank God they didn't get very far. But uh, well, do you think those are fundraising proposals, or are you suggesting they're they're attempts to limit, you know, to discourage people from coming? Trying to get the more higher end big spenders. Oh, I, well, I think both. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, the other point you made in your column, which was very important, which is, was that it might not even be a good idea. I mean, despite the the, the sensitivities of of the survivors, um, a lot of people, even they, even they might not even realize how important it is to them 
that tourism resume. It's such a major driver of our economy in Hawaii. Um, it certainly has its drawbacks, but essentially it's a, it's a, it, it was originally perceived as a really clean industry. You know, it's not manufacturing. It doesn't produce a lot of smoke or, or, or ravage the, the hillsides or anything. Uh, there is overuse of the environment to some extent. A lot of people going to the beaches and whatever, but it's a, it's a clean industry. And, um, it seems to me that, um, well, it's our only industry. Yeah. I mean, you have to, you have to, uh, look at it for what it is right now. Uh, it's the number one industry that we have, and in in economic terms, you know, we 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 may have, you know, a little bit of uh, agriculture here and there. We have, we may have a little manufacturing here and there. We may have a little, uh, you know, high tech business here and there, but nothing on the same scale. So government has an interest in uh, getting the economic activity back on track as well. Particularly yeah. since it's uh, it will help Lahaina recover. I mean, it, it's that's where the jobs are for for the people over there. And and if there's no tourism, there there won't be very many jobs, and and that will just delay recovery for Lahaina forever. Yep, that's 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 exactly right. Well, Tom, so, um, I think we've uh, covered the the field here on this topic. I look forward to talking more about this and other things in future episodes. Uh, I want to thank all our viewers today for tuning in. Uh, I'm Mark Coleman at the Grassroot Institute. My co-host here, the main man, Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Please join us again next episode. Take care. Have a great day. Aloha.